Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, inshallah you're, you're all doing fine. Uh, we'll be talking today about blood coagulation. Now this is a beautiful lecture uh, as you will see and I hope you will enjoy it. Um, so let's, let's start the resources. Uh, first the lecture itself which is basically um, taken from uh, two re other resources, Harper's Medical Biochemistry, the 31st edition, chapter 55, and Mark's Basic Medical Biochemistry, 7th edition, chapter 43. Definition of what blood coagulation is. So it is basically, uh, it, it describes an orchestrated biochemical process. So I chose the word orchestrated because as as you read it as you go through it it's almost like a music it, it's like a classical music of Japan or or Beethoven um, or Mozart or, or whomever um, you will see that the the it's it's like a classical music so it goes slow and then uh, it, it it goes up and up and up and it reaches a climax and then you see the music going down until you get to the end. So it's really basically a, a symphony. So it's basically, again, it's a biochemical process. It is initiated as a result of vascular injury. So you have an injury with, uh, in, in a small area and blood in, the, in this area changes from liquid to gel. So basically you have the formation of a clot of fibers um, of a protein known as fibrin. Now that results in hemostasis. So there is no more blood loss loss. And then, and then this is followed by clot dissolution and repair. That is the end of the symphony. These are the, the basic steps. Uh, you have a, physiological uh, effect first uh, uh, basically you have vascular constriction it limits blood flow to the area of injury this is followed by a chemical process cellular and and biochemical you have activation of platelets and their aggregation at the site of injury forming what is known as a platelet plug now this platelet plug is loose and it becomes uh, it becomes solidified uh, and it becomes hard as uh, what we call a hard clot uh, via the formation of a fibrin mesh so you have a network of all of these fibers surrounding and entrapping the platelet cells now this is followed by again dissolution of the clot uh, enzymatically as we will see at the end of this lecture so what are platelets? Platelets are small anuclear cell fragments. They are produced from large cells known as megakaryocytes. Okay, so you have these uh, cellular fragments that are produced from these cells. Now inside platelets, you have cellular components. Uh, you have, of course, the plasma membrane, but you also have the actin cytoskeleton, uh, there are vesicles, there are proteins, there are signaling factors, and we will talk about all of these. Now, inside these platelets, there, there are granules or vesicles. Now, there are three types of vesicles. You have electron-dense vesicles. Uh, these contain calcium ions, they also contain ADP, ATP, and serotonin. Now the reason why you have ADP and ATP inside these vesicles is that they're not really used as uh, sources of energy, rather they are used as signaling molecules. You have also alpha granules inside platelets and these granules contain heparin antagonist, uh, yeah, the signaling molecule, platelet-derived growth factor, you have the structural protein fibrinogen, uh, a, a regulatory protein known as Va von Willebrand factor, and there are numerous clotting factors uh, inside these vesicles. And then you have lysosomal 
granules or vesicles and these contain hydrolytic enzymes. Now these enzymes are necessary uh, again for removal of the clot, um, activation of different proteins and so on. So what happens with these platelets is, is that once they are activated, so once there is an injury and once they are activated, these granules fuse with the plasma membrane, releasing their contents. So here we have a platelet, a representation of a platelet, and you can see there are numerous receptors on the cell surface. You have uh, a receptor for epinephrine, a receptor for ADP, another for thrombin, and so on. There are also glycoproteins on the cell surface, and these are important for interacting with collagen, von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen, and so on. These are also important for forming uh, aggregation of platelets at the site of injury. Now, also uh, on, on the surface, you have the process of blood coagulation going on. Okay. Now, so first thing that happens is that whenever you have a vascular injury, a protein known as von Willebrand factor is exposed. Now, this leads to platelet binding to this von Willebrand factor and activation of the platelets. That would cause a series of signaling um, uh, reactions inside the cell and that leads to uh, uh, secretion of a number of factors. Again, you have ADP, serotonin, uh, factor 5, calcium ions, ATP, fibrinogen, more von Willebrand factor, thrombin, and thromboxanes. Now what happens, you know, these bind to receptors or they, ha they have specific functions as, as you will see. Now, what happens as well is that once the platelets are activated, their shape changes. Now this change in cell shape results in more platelet platelet ag uh, in adhesion and aggregation. Now, as you will see later on, thrombin is a major uh, player in blood coagulation. It binds to a receptor. Um, it's a G protein coupled receptor uh, called thrombin receptor. Eventually it activates the uh, enzyme phospholipase C beta. Now phospholipase C beta hydrolyzes phosphatidyl uh, inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, PIP2, into two major products. The first is diacetylisterol, and the other one is inositol triphosphate, IP3. Now IP3 works on releasing calcium ions from uh, stores, intracellular stores. Diacetylglycerol, on the other hand, activates uh, protein kinase C. Now, let's go back to calcium ions. Now, these calcium ions can activate uh, two other proteins. The first one is phospholipase uh, A2, and the other one is uh, myosin light chain kinase. So let's go here. Now, phospholipase A2 uh, works on releasing arachidonate from the plasma membrane of uh, platelets, followed by a cyclooxygenase enzyme that converts arachidonate uh, eventually to thromboxane A2. Now, thromboxane A2 is a vasodilator, uh, sorry, it's a vasoconstrictor, and it further induces uh, phospholipase C beta because it gets secreted and it binds to its receptor as well. So it induces platelet aggregation. Now, it can function in an autocrine and paracrine manners, meaning that it, it acts on the same platelet that uh, releases it and it acts on neighboring platelets as well. Now, 
there are other vasoconstrictors or another vasoconstrictor that is important is serotonin and it's also released from platelets and there is also a platelet derived growth factor that is released and it stimulates proliferation of endothelial cells reducing blood flow so eventually what happens is that you have slowing down of blood flow allowing for platelets to accumulate and aggregate previously in uh, introductory biochemistry we talked about the action of aspirin on the synthesis of eicosanoids uh, specifically prostaglandins thromboxanes um, uh, cyclooxygenase uh, prostacyclins and and so on so um, what, what these do is that what aspirin does is that it inhibits the enzyme cyclooxygenase and that prevents the production of prostaglandins and thromboxins okay now the thing is um, uh, so aspirin is beneficial in reducing uh, myocardial the incidence of myocardial infarction because it reduces the platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction now um, so you you notice that throughout this lecture that there is a balance between um, in the actions of molecules that have opposing uh, effects or opposing actions. So, for example, thromboxane is, is a vasoconstrictor, but uh, aspirin also inhibits the production of prostacyclins. Okay. Now, prostacyclins are uh, uh, they prevent platelet aggregation, and um, it, it is also a vasodilator. So, we have a vasoconstrictor in thromboxanes, and we have a vasodilator in prostacyclins. Now, which molecule does win the competition? Um, it's actually prostacyclins eventually. Okay, why? Because once cyclooxygenase is inhibited, uh, platelets cannot regenerate cyclooxygenase, and as a result, they cannot produce more thromboxanes. On the other hand, the source of prostacyclins is endothelial cells. So, if uh, uh, cyclooxygenase is inhibited, uh, it should be no problem because these cells can regenerate. Uh, cyclooxygenase they can synthesize more cyclooxygenase so something else that I would like to uh, point out is that you really have to be cautious about prescribing aspirin especially to the elderly it's true that uh, it's quite beneficial in reducing incidence of myocardial infarction however uh, two clinical trials the results of two clinical trials were published in 2018, uh, pointing out that uh, aspirin can actually be harmful, especially to the elderly, where it causes excessive bleeding and hemorrhage in, in many cases. So uh, you have to be cautious about uh, the, the uh, actions of aspirin. So, what calcium ions do, in addition to activation of phospholipase A2 and release of arachidonate from phospholipids, is that it can bind to a kinase known as myosin light chain kinase. It phosphorylates myosin light chain, and this phosphorylated myosin light chain has a number of effects. One of them is that it stimulates the further fusion of these granules with the plasma membrane, and uh, eventually they release their contents. Now, myosin light chain kinase also modifies the actin cytoskeleton, so it can modulate, it can induce motility, and it also changes cell morphology, platelet morphology, leading again to more aggregation of platelets. Now, the other side of the equation uh, is diacylglycerol, which is the second product of uh, hydrolysis of PIP2. What diacylglycerol does is that it winds to protein kinase C. It phosphorylates several proteins, including protein 47, and this leads to, again, further release of granular contents, including ADP. So what does ADP do? ADP is a platelet activator. What it does is that it binds to its receptor, all right, and it modifies platelet membrane, allowing for fibrinogen to bind to a platelets, 
to the glycoproteins on platelets, resulting in further uh, platelet aggregation. And this is known as a platelet plug. And we'll talk about platelet plug um, later on in this lecture. Now, something else is that the surface of uh, platelets is the theater for the blood coagulation process, the biochemical reactions that lead to blood coagulation. And this is the topic or the, the next topic of this lecture. So let's talk about coagulation, the, the biochemical reactions that take place um, in order to um, form blood clots. Now, there are a number of players in the process of blood coagulation. Some are small, like calcium ions and vitamin K. Others are large, like platelets themselves. And you have molecules in between. So first, we have the organizing surface of platelets. We already talked about that. You have also proteolytic zymogens. That is, uh, remember what zymogens are. Zymogens are enzymes that require proteolytic cleavage in order for them to be active. So in, in introductory biochemistry, we talked about trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen proelastase. They require uh, chemical modification, proteolytic modification, uh, generating the active enzymes, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and so on. Now, these zymogens in the process of blood coagulation include pre-calicrin, prothrombin, as well as a number of proteins known as factors, and they are designated with Roman numbers. And these are known as factors 7, you have 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13. Now, these are mainly serine proteases. They are released from hepatocytes. Once they're activated, they are designated with the subscript A. So, for example, a factor 13, once activated, it's called 13A. You also have other proteins that function as anticoagulants, so they are inhibitors of blood coagulation, and these include protein C and protein S. There are non-enzymatic protein cofactors, including factors 8, 5, and a protein known as tissue factor. As I said, there are calcium ions, vitamin K, and then we have fibrinogen, which forms the fibrin network. So this is a list of the different clotting factors, their names, and what their functions are. So as you go through this lecture, you can go back to this slide to, again, to sort of like summarize what the process is. So note that factor two, for example, is the prothrombin. Factor one is fibrinogen. Okay. Factor four is calcium ions themselves. Okay. So, so, so the, so these factors do not necessarily indicate a protein. Now, now classically, blood coagulation has been classified into two pathways that were independent. They were thought to be independent. And these are known as the extrinsic pathway and the other is the intrinsic pathway. So basically, um, the extrinsic pathway is activated in response to tissue injury. The intrinsic pathway can be activated as a result of a, an internal effect like inflammation, for example. So basically, uh, but it has been found that actually these pathways are not totally independent. Rather, there is a bridge that connects both to each other 
And when the extrinsic pathway is activated, you have activation of the intrinsic pathway as well. So they are really interconnected and not totally independent of each other. But both pathways converge at a single point, which is activation of factor 10. And factor 10 is responsible for activating factor 2, which is thrombin. And thrombin can form, again, the fibrin polymers or the fibrin mesh or network. So what we will do is go over this pathway right here. <clears throat> now, so you have the extrinsic pathway. You have vascular injury. Something happens uh, to the vasculature. Exposure of collagen as well as von Willebrand factor result in the activation of factor 7. Factor 7, then, uh, with the help of tissue factor, it activates factor 10. Now, in the intrinsic pathway, um, the tissue factor also plays an important role as it forms a bridge whereby, the, uh, whereby factor 7 can activate factor 9 and factor 9 can activate factor 10. So as I said, you have uh, the both pathways converge at this point right here with the activation of factor 10. Now factor 10 activates prothrombin, thrombin forms the uh, fibrin network. Now, in case of inflammation, you also have activation of the calicrine kinin uh, pathway where I have activation of factor uh, 12 which activates factor 11 and factor 11 activates factor 9. So there are a number of cofactors that play an important role in this process. And these are the non-enzymatic cofactors like uh, tissue factor, factor 8, um, uh, factor 5, and so on. <clears throat> now, pay attention also to the involvement of phospholipids, that is the surface of platelets and calcium ions in the process of activation. Now, so this is sort of like a, an illustration of the different domains, or different proteins and different domains. Now, what, I'm, what I care about really is the presence of a domain known as the GLA domain or the glutamate domain right here and this glutamate domain if you notice it exists in the prothrombin protein factor um, 7 factor 9 factor 10 as well as protein c and protein s the anticoagulants so what is the gla domain or the glutamate domain so basically, this domain is a sequence of um, a primary, it's part of the primary structure of these proteins, factors uh, 9, 10, 7, and prothrombin, and the other ones that I just mentioned. Now, in this domain right here, it's rich with glutamate. So you have about 9 to 12 uh, glutamate residues within this domain. This is actually, the, this, the glutamate residues are the substrates for an enzyme known as a carboxylase enzyme. What this enzyme does is that it adds another carboxyl group. So you have a glutamate with two carboxyl groups, looking like this. That leads to interaction uh, between glutamate with the calcium ions. Okay. Now, and this helps in, in binding of these proteins with the plasma membrane of platelets. So you have in the plasma membrane, you have the phospholipid head groups, which are negatively charged and calcium ions are positively charged. So 
calcium ions sort of mediate interaction of these proteins with the plasma membrane. The, the interaction or the insertion of these proteins with the plasma membrane is also solidified by having a hydrophobic region in these proteins. So that helps inserting the proteins into the plasma membrane. And that's what makes the coagulation uh, by a chemical process uh, take place on the surface of platelets. Now the carboxylation reaction requires vitamin K as a source of electrons. So vitamin K is oxidized into what is known as a vitamin K epoxide. Now, and you have the carboxylation reaction take place, addition of a carboxyl group to glutamate. Now it's very important for uh, vitamin K epoxide to be reduced to regenerate the active form of vitamin K. And this happens also enzymatically with an enzyme known as vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme. And this requires NADH as a source of electrons. This enzyme right here is the target of the antagonist, famous antagonist known as warfarin. And we'll talk about, about it later on. A side note on vitamin K is that newborns are at risk for early vitamin K deficiency. And that may lead to bleeding. The reason is that there are four reasons actually. The first is that the placenta really is a poor passage channel for fat soluble compounds such as vitamin K. Neonates are also born with immature liver that uh, is not able to, uh, to, to produce these coagulation factors and to modify uh, the factors at the glutamate residues. Something else is that breast milk is a poor source of vitamin K. And the last reason is that the intestinal flora, which are the main source of vitamin K in humans, is not really mature yet. It's not established. Now, how do we know that these newborns have vitamin K deficiency? There are a number of uh, uh, symptoms or the number of signs or manifestations. One of them is bleeding, gum bleeding, as well as uh, formation of bruises and so on. So what happens is, as I said, the two pathways converge at the activation of factor 10. So factor 10 forms a complex with factor 5, and this is known as the prothrombinase complex. This interaction takes place as a result of with the as a result of interacting with the calcium ions. Same thing happens with prothrombin. It can also uh, interact with factor 5 with the help of calcium ions. Now so factor five, what it does is that it brings both of these factor 10 and prothrombin close to each other and factor 10, which is already active, it cleaves prothrombin forming the active enzyme thrombin. So we have the involvement of other factors in the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway as well. So in the extrinsic pathway, uh, prior to activation of factor 10, you have, the, uh, activa you have the activation of factor 7 uh, with the help of tissue factor. In the intrinsic pathway, you also have the involvement of tissue factor, which activates factor 9, and it can activate or it can help in the activation of factor 10 by associating with factor 8. So, so we have two factors that are important for increasing the efficiency of, uh, of factors uh, 10 and 9. And these are factor uh, 5 and factor 8. Now these are docking molecules. So what they do is that they, they stabilize uh, enzymes on the cell surface. So in case of the intrinsic pathway, we have factor eight, 
that sits on the plasma membrane of platelets and it forms a, a what is what is known as a, um, a, a in an intrinsic kinase complex because it eventually uh, activates the uh, factor 10. So, and, and this complex is made of factor 8, and then we have factor 9, and calcium ions as well. So, this complex allows for the activation of factor 10. Now, we also have what is known as the extrinsic kinase complex, and it's made of a protein, the uh, tissue factor, as well as uh, factor 7, and calcium ions. And this uh, complex right here activates factor 10 as well. Notice as well that tissue factor also uh, complexes with factor um, 7 and they uh, activate factor 9. Now factor 8 is, uh, an, has a very short life if it circulates by itself in uh, the blood. So uh, it is not found by itself. Rather, most of it is found complex with a protein known as von Willebrand factor. This uh, protein right here is synthesized and secreted by endothelial cells and platelets. So most of factor 8 is found complexed with, with the von Willebrand uh, factor. In case of uh, uh, von Willebrand factor deficiency, it causes uh, a condition where you have, uh, it's called van Willebrand factor deficiency, whereby there, uh, a patient would have excessive uh, bleeding. Now, tissue factor is an integral membrane protein that is expressed on the surface of activated monocytes and subendothelial cells, as well as other cells. So really, blood cells and platelets are not exposed to subendothelial cells unless they are injured, unless there is tissue injury. Then you can have, act, you can have platelets binding to, uh, to, to, uh, to a tissue factor. Once you have this interaction with tissue factor, uh, you can have the activation of factor uh, 10 in the intrinsic pathway. In the extrinsic pathway, I'm sorry. Now, in the intrinsic pathway, you also have the involvement of tissue factor, whereby it is important for activating factor 9, which activates factor 10. Now, the interaction between or the complex of tissue factor with, with factor uh, 7 is known as the initiation complex because you have uh, both of these pathways, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, activated. What tissue factor does, by the way, is that it increases the efficiency, the proteolytic efficiency of factor 7. Let's look upstream of the intrinsic pathway. So the, a major player in the intrinsic pathway in initiating the intrinsic pathway is factor 12. Now this factor 12 has several substrates, um, including plasminogen, which is cleaved by factor 12, activating it into plasmid and plasmin, and it is involved in fibrinolysis or removal of the fibrin clot. Factor 12 is also involved in, in the immune response by activating the complement system, and we're not going to talk about this. Another substrate is factor 11, which, once activated by factor 12, it can activate factor 9, which activates factor 10. Now, an, an important substrate of factor 12 is an enzyme uh, known as calicrin, which exists in the inactive form known as pre-calicrin. Now, pre-calicrin is activated by factor 12, and calicrin can then activate more factor 12. So we have a positive feedback loop, activation loop. So you have more and more activation of these two enzymes. Now, factor 12 
uh, also cleaves a, a protein known as high molecular weight kininogen into a peptide known as bradykinin. Bradykinin can then bind to receptors on the cell surface of different proteins, including endothelial cells, uh, in, in muscle cells, and it uh, causes uh, vasodilation, allowing for accumulation or recruitment of more cells, including uh, platelets. Okay, so what happens is now the music is going up, okay? Now you have activation of all of these molecules and then we're getting to the, uh, uh, to the climax of the coagulation process. So you have activation of factor 10. Factor 10 activates prothrombin into thrombin. Thrombin functions or it acts on fibrinogen. So what it does is that it converts fibrinogen into fibrin. How does it do that? By re removing a number of uh, peptides of the protein. Now this results in the ability of fibrin molecules to form electrostatic interactions between the head and the tails of two other molecules. So you have the head right here forming uh, electrostatic interactions with uh, the tails of two other fibrins and so on. So what, what happens here is that you have aggregation of the fibrin molecules uh, together forming a clot and this clot is known as a soft clot because the interaction between all of these molecules is based on electrostatic interactions which is non-covenant. So in addition to cleaving uh, the fibrinogen into fibrin, thrombin can act on another protein, and it is known as factor 13. Factor 13 is a transglutaminase, and what it does is that it forms a covalent interaction, cross-linking between a glutamine on, uh, of one uh, fibrin monomer to a lysine on another fibrin monomer. So you have the formation of a, now a hard clot, okay? Now, because of the covalent interaction or, or bond or cross-linking between the different fibrin molecules. Now this clot not, not, only, not only contains uh, the, the fibrin, uh, fibrin uh, network, they also entrap platelets inside, forming what is known as a platelet plug. Now, now we're really getting to the climax of the symphony. What happens here is that you have activation of all of these molecules and it's getting even amplified. The reason is that you have feedback activation. So you have the thrombin molecule acting back on all of these factors. So what it does is that it, it activates more factor five, more of factor eight, more of factor 11, and it can also act on factor seven as well. So you have more amplification, you have more activation of, of all of these uh, zymogens, specifically getting to the end to the uh, factor 10 that activates more and more prothrombin to thrombin. So now the music is going down. So let's talk about the anti-clotting factors. So once thrombin is activated, what it does is that it binds to a protein known as thrombomodulin. This protein is present on the surface of endothelial cells. Now, it brings thrombin closer to a protein known as protein C. Protein C is activated by thrombin forming activated protein C. It forms a complex with protein S, which is present on the surface of platelets. Now, this complex, the complex of protein C, protein S, can degrade factors 5 and 8. So you have termination 
of activate, activation of uh, uh, prothrombin and activation of factor 10. A major inhibitor of thrombin is a molecule known as antithrombin-3. Now, not only that it inhibits uh, thrombin, it can also inhibit other factors such as factors uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, and it can also inhibit uh, f uh, factor 7 when it, uh, when it is complex with tissue factor. Now, antithrombin-3, in order for it to function, it has to bind to heparin, a glycose aminoglycan. So the, the positively charged amino acid uh, lysine residues of antithrombin-3 would interact with the acetic site of heparin. The structure of antithrombin-3 uh, can then, uh, it changes, allowing it to bind to thrombin and inactivating it. So this heparin sulfate is an important cofactor for antithrombin-3. This molecule is synthesized by, by mast cells. It is present on the cell surface of endothelial cells. And like I said, it, it binds to uh, thrombin um, and inhibits it. Now, this uh, molecule heparin is important as an anticoagulant. It is used in laboratories in, in tubes where um, uh, when, when blood is collected, it, it prevents blood coagulation. So another inhibitor is tissue factor pathway inhibitor. Now, what this inhibitor does is that it can bind to uh, factor 10, and then it can interact with the complex of tissue factor factor um, 7, inhibiting the whole thing. And that prevents the activation of factors 10 as well as factor 9. Now, the other thing about this protein, the tissue factor pathway inhibitor, is that it can also prevent the uh, prothrombinase complex. Uh, it, it, by interacting with factor 10, it can uh, also inhibit, it, inhibit the activation of prothrombin uh, to thrombin. Now, Anticoagulants can also be used, and these are calcium chelators, as well as vitamin K antagonists. So you already know that calcium is important for the process of coagulation. So by using chelators that absorb calcium ions, um, that prevents the, uh, the it, it compromises the efficiency of blood coagulation. Now, there is a drug known as warfarin, and what, what warfarin does is that it inhibits the vitamin K epoxide reductase, preventing the regeneration of the active form of vitamin K, the reduced form. So there would be inability of the carboxylase enzyme to carboxylate glutamate, and that again compromises interaction of proteins uh, to the surface of platelets and uh, inducing uh, blood coagulation. So now the music is going down. Okay, I hope you can imagine that. So now what happens is that there is a clot, there is a reduction in bleeding, a cessation of bleeding, um, the clot must be removed and there is renewal of cells as well. So now the clot must be removed. And this happens simultaneously with the activation of blood coagulation, by the way. Okay, so that things do not go uh, out of control. And the, the dissolution of blood clots is basically enzymatically dependent. And this is done by a protein or a protease known as plasmin. Plasmin is a serine protease. It, it is activated from its precursor plasminogen. Now, uh, plasmin is responsible for fibrinolysis. It's responsible for hydrolyzing and degrading the fibrin network. Uh, 
and it just happens that plasminogen has high affinity for fi fibrin clots so otherwise it doesn't really bind to fibrin so look at this so plasmin is activated uh, it can uh, degrade fibrin this activation process is uh, induced by a plasminogen activator known as tissue plasminogen activator and it's also induced by uh, what, what is known as urokinase plasminogen activator now the tissue plasminogen activator is activated by protein c the activated protein c the anticoagulant that we talked about before that degrades factors uh, five and seven so at the same time activated protein c inactivates the inhibitor of plasminogen activator so what you have in here is is, uh, uh, is induction stimulation of the fibrinolysis um, process. You also have um, uh, a, an, in, a, an inhibitor known as antiplasmin. And this antiplasmin keeps things in check. It inhibits plasmin, but not when plasminogen and plasmin are clot bound. Okay? So this is beautiful. So if you have a plasmin that is soluble, that is outside the clot, it is immediately inhibited by the antiplasmin. But as long as it is bound to the clot, degrading it, lysing it, removing it, it's active and it cannot be inhibited by the antiplasmin. That uh, ensures the removal of the clot without compromising or affecting the surrounding tissue and surrounding proteins. Something else is that there is a, 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 a molecule known as streptokinase, and this is not an enzyme, by the way. Streptokinase is used clinically. Um, it's produced from streptococci bacteria, and it can activate uh, the circulating plasminogen to form plasmin. So what it does is that it facilitates the removal of the blood clot. A major um, player in fibrinolysis is a protease known as plasmin. Plasmin degrades fibrin into uh, uh, smaller products. Now this plasmin right here uh, associates with fibrin and it gets activated from plasminogen. So it is a zymogen right here. So uh, Plasminogen has high affinity for fibrin clot, and it gets activated when it associates with the fibrin clot. So, fibr so plasmin stays intact or stays bound uh, or, let's say, restricted uh, into or inside the fibrin clot. Once it gets released from the fibrin clot, it gets inactivated by antiplasmin, alpha-2 antiplasmin. Okay? However, if plasmin is uh, bound to the fibrin uh, clot, uh, antiplasmin doesn't have access to it, so it cannot inhibit it. So how is the zymogen degraded or, or cleaved? Uh, what does activate plasminogen? Well, there are two activators. These are known as tissue plasminogen activator and urokinase type plasminogen activator. What these do is that they cleave the, uh, the N-terminal uh, portion of plasminogen activating, activating it or converting it to the active form of the uh, enzyme. Well, these two are also regulated by inhibitors. And there are two types of inhibitors. First, there is a specific inhibitor known as plasminogen activator inhibitor and, um, and it, it targets both the plasminogen activator uh, tissue type and urokinase type. Okay. And the other uh, inhibitor is known as uh, thrombin activatable fibrinolysis inhibitor or TAFI. Now, what this does right here is that it removes uh, the, the N-terminal lysine residues in fibrin. So why are these lysine residues important? Because this is how 
plasmin uh, bind to the fibrin clot. Okay, so so when when these lysine residues are removed, now plasmin cannot bind to fibrin and it gets released and inhibited right away by antiplasmin. Now uh, what this does as well is that it directly inhibits uh, the tissue uh, uh, plasminogen activator. Okay, so. Um, Something else is that activated protein C can also activate tissue plasminogen activator, and it also uh, by releasing it, okay, and it inhibits a plasminogen activator inhibitor. So, so activated uh, uh, protein C is an inducer of fibrinolysis. Something else, another uh, molecule that we want to talk about is, um, is streptokinase, which is a protein that is isolated, isolated from bacteria, and it allows for the auto-activation of plasminogen into uh, plasma. So plasminogen can activate itself. Um, so what streptokinase does is that it, it uh, induces the removal of the fibrin clot, and it, it is used as a treatment. So in addition to tissue plasminogen activator, there is urokinase uh, plasminogen activator, which is, um, again, it's an, it activates plasminogen to plasmin, and it can also be used clinically. So thrombin is important for a number of reasons. One, it has its own receptor, right? So what it does is that it recruits platelets, it activates platelets, and it recruits them to the site of injury. It amplifies the coagulation complex. It forms the soft clot with the uh, fibrinogen, with the fibrin monomers uh, forming a network. It also forms the heart clot by activating factor 13. But what it does as well is that it terminates coagulation, and this is the topic of the, the next topic of this lecture. But it does have other actions as well. So it can so thrombin itself can bind to what is known as protease activated receptors. And what these receptors do is that these receptors are present on uh, the surface of of number of cells, including uh, endothelial cells, and and what, what they do is that they can modulate, they can induce vascular remodeling, for example, angiogenesis, formation of new blood vessels, as well as inducing uh, inflammation. So is thrombin the maestro? I don't know. It could be endothelial cells as well, because they play a very important role in blood coagulation. See, endothelial cells can release nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Uh, it releases prostacyclin and ADPase. And what these do is that they inhibit, altogether what, what these three do is that they, they inhibit uh, platelet adhesion and aggregation. So endothelial cells would prevent the formation of clots. Now, something else about endothelial cells is that they have heparin sulfate on the cell surface. And heparin sulfate binds to antithrombin-3, and antithrombin-3 can then inhibit thrombin, preventing clotting. Okay. Now, um, endothelial cells also express the tissue factor uh, pathway inhibitor, which inhibits the uh, tissue factor as well as uh, factors um, 10, and seven. Thrombomodulin is another molecule that exists on the surface of endothelial cells, and thrombomodulin binds to thrombin, which binds to protein C, and protein C inhibits factors five and eight by degrading them. Uh, another thing is that endothelial cells can um, uh, prevent accumulation or formation of the, the fibrin clot and they induce uh, its lysis by releasing plasminogen activators, uh, TPA and UPA, as well as uh, their inhibitor. So they balance out uh, the, the, uh, the fibrin uh, formation, clot formation, and uh, lysis as well.
So it's really a symphony. It starts slow and then the music goes up and then it slows down at the end. So really when when I read about blood coagulation and all of the events that take place, it's like Vivaldi's four seasons. So listen to Vivaldi as you're you're studying this lecture and uh, and connect the music to the biological process. Enjoy.